Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Now comes the fun part of the discussion with Dr. Jane Aronson. Dr. Jane Aronson is a clinical assistant professor at pediatrics at Wild Cornell Medicine, 2000 to 2021, founder and former CEO of Worldwide Orphans, 1997 to 2019, director of international pediatric health services, and the global, the global behavioral health network for children and young people. And she was also my son's first doctor. <laughs> Also, we have Candace Davenport. She's the health officer, public health nursing supervisor, and health educator for the Maplewood Health Department. She has clinical experience in maternal child health and pediatric intensive care, and almost 20 years working in various levels of governmental public health, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Somerset County Health Department in Bioterrorism, Pandemic Influenza and Emergency Preparedness, New Jersey Department of Health and Vaccine Preventable Diseases, and Rutgers University. She has been with the Maplewood Health Department for nine years and became the health officer in January 2020 at the start of the COVID pandemic. pandemic. Thank goodness for Candace. <laughs> I work, I work with Canvas for five years now, and I did not know all this until today. <laughs> and finally, Anna Markarova grew up in Maplewood South Orange community and completed her undergraduate education at Rutgers University in 2018 with a bachelor's in public health. That same year, she entered an accelerated nursing program at Rutgers University to obtain a bachelor's in nursing and graduated in January 2020. Shortly after passing her nursing boards, Anna became a registered nurse in February 2020 and was hired by the Maplewood Health Department. Never would she have thought a month later we would be hit by a global pandemic. 19 months later, Anna has learned more about public health nursing in this short time than many learn in their lifetime, and for that she is grateful. I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa Resnick now. who have had COVID, unfortunately, multiple times. So there are some duplicates there, but it has been about 2,000 people in Maplewood that have been affected so far. And like Anna said, 39 residents have passed away since the start of the pandemic. 
So it's very personal for us, this um, pandemic and the experience. Um, 17, over 1,700 cases is not insignificant in our opinion. Part of our job is to monitor it daily. It becomes, um, for local health, health officials, it's a struggle between keeping the health and safety of the community, but also keeping the wellness and the, and the uh, emotional and social development of the community as well. Uh, all of us can say that it has been a long 19 months, both for our health and safety and for our mental health. And isolation can be lonely, quarantine can be lonely, stay at home orders can be lonely. So coming out of this, and we're still in this, but opening up the economy like Dr. Fauci said, and also having to clap together the health and safety is a struggle that we try to deal with on a daily basis to try to make the best that we can out of these 19 months. Dr. Aronson, how were the NIH and the pharmaceutical companies able to develop an effective COVID vaccine at a faster pace than Dr. Fauci expected they would? Um, I, I'm so grateful to be here tonight. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I can answer all of these questions or what I, um, I, would, I would love to, but I think I want to strike a balance here and indicate this is probably not appreciated by most people around the world, and that is that messenger RNA vaccines are not, it's not a new idea. The idea that we could use vaccines that were not associated with the actual virus itself, like the J&J &J vaccine, for instance, which uses adenovirus. Um, that idea has been around probably 20 plus years. And just to remind everybody, I mean, vaccines have been around a very long time. Does anyone recall learning in elementary school what the first vaccine was? Yes. Probably. Yeah, and that was Edward Jenner. What year was that? Um, the early 1800s. 1792. And the principle that was used at that time is the same principle that we all in medicine and nursing have studied all these years, and that is using organisms, attenuating them, and treating them somehow in a way that then will um, inspire the immune system to create the appropriate cells and antibody proteins to fight against the infection. Um, so, you know, in, in dealing with the question that you asked about how, how fast things happen, I think the film makes a very uh, profound case for the fact that, uh, and I'm going to recommend a book actually for everyone to read, and that's Paul Offit, who's a pediatrician and on the uh, advisory committee for immunization practices tremendously brilliant um, vaccine uh, scientist. And the reason why I bring him up is because there's, there's ideas that I think we've missed during this time in, in the last two years regarding uh, pandemic diseases, viruses that we'll face in the future. And that is that each time we face a virus as a possible candidate for spreading and becoming a pandemic, we have a learning curve. We have a long runway, even though we have a great understanding of the science. I think the important thing to remember is that there really is, unfortunately, uh, uh, the pace of being able to come to a, a point where we can cure uh, this kind of infection is really not predictable. So when you think about the history of mRNA vaccine, that's 20 years. And so sometimes people just think that this thing sort of just snapped up and happened, but it was all based on really amazingly brilliant ideas about uh, you know, immunology, particularly, and the use of RNA and DNA to be able to actually facilitate a mechanism to teach our own cells to produce antibodies against, in this case, the spike proteins for the coronavirus. So I think my contribution here on this one is that um, it's unpredictable. And I think, uh, let me just share with you quickly, I, I know Tony personally, as a member of the generation of those who were taught by Dr. Fauci, we all have this sort of amazing, similar experience, even if we may not have 
been together at the time we all met him, but we all cruised down to D.C. for all the sessions early on. I'm an AIDS physician. I was trained in the 80s in medical school, and my, you know, really my first 20 years of my career were really devoted to pediatric and family AIDS. And then I became a global um, AIDS specialist. And so we would all go to D.C. for the protocols in order to centralize and make sure that our country was solid in the science, uh, Dr. Fauci created ways in which we could sit in sessions personally with one another. With doctors all over the country, nurses, psychologists, social workers, and finally, of course, uh, lay people who represented the advocacy piece that you saw so splendidly um, depicted in this story. And I think that what we learned in those sessions was we learned to be creative. We learned that we could have many different ideas and we could share with one another in his presence and he would walk around. He is a little guy. <laughs> He's a very little guy, but he would walk around the sessions, go room to room. He might give a very short speech or presentation. He was never a guy who had that much of a presence, but he had a presence as a teacher. And I think that if I were to add some you know, comments about the film, I'd say that what we're missing, in a sense, is the piece of him uh, that was really pretty folksy, and that is that he really knew how to teach us the scientific method. And I feel very lucky to have uh, experienced that because I think it really uh, affected me and inspired me to be a, a scientist, not just a pediatrician, um, and, uh, but really a scientist, which I think is the also the crux of the film, is to really have people understand how important science is here and how science can be slow and plodding, but really has to be the pure way in which we understand any disease going forward. So drug companies, of course, did, a, you know, obviously the big piece here for both the AIDS epidemic and uh, uh, the current pandemic funny, they're both pandemics. And honestly, for me, I, 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 my years in medicine, or from those first 20 years, I felt AIDS was a pandemic, and then I got the opportunity to go and treat children and families abroad in Ethiopia and Haiti and Vietnam. And um, I think that what we understand is that the pharmaceutical partnership with the scientists is just profoundly important but I think the other piece is that a lot of what we learned over the last uh, 40 years that Dr. Fauci has been ahead of NIA is that pharmaceuticals are expensive, labor intensive, and there's a lot of politics around medication, which you know, we can't go into tonight, but I think that's the saddest part of the story around AIDS was the lack of excess, you know, access for uh, people um, in our own country who didn't have resources and were underserved, diverse individuals, particularly women and children who did not have access to treatment. And that was the prevalent, um, unfortunate um, you know, threat to our own country as well as globally. And, and frankly, uh, it's the same, which wasn't really discussed here tonight, but it's very important for all of you to understand that COVID or any pandemic that comes really has to be a world problem. I, I kind of uh, feel like I'm, I'm doing a little preaching, but I feel this doesn't get covered. M much of what I'm talking about today and what you saw tonight isn't really covered on C you know, in CNN or any news programs or even things that are written. Some things beautifully written for the New Yorker magazine have just been profound in being able to really look at the politics and the way in which we handle the pandemic globally. So I really have to sort of, I want to make sure I, I tell you from my point of view as a global position that I think our inability to make this a global issue that we all address is really kind of sad and, and it's important to recognize that we have a responsibility to one another to work together against any pandemic. So the hope and the future would be in the future Know, in years to come, that there'll be incredibly mechanized 
surveillance programs that are particularly dominated by immunology and genetics that we'll know how to genotype every vicious creature who appears before us and we can really focus on the molecular aspect of treating these infections, preventing these infections from becoming pandemic. Could you tell us? Could you tell us a little bit about the approval process by the FDA and why yeah. it did it was didn't take as long and they had the emergency use? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of like protocols that we should all understand about approval. And if, and I think again, I'm going <laughs> to be philosophical about it, and that really the, the urgency and the emergency factor has to drive how we handle pandemics. So we may have protocols from the Food and Drug Administration, and we may even have emergency uh, protocols for EUA uh, authorization. But it's a decision that people make personally. A few people sitting at a table have to sit down and make decisions and make recommendations that then they may change their minds about. And that's not anyone's fault. That's the other piece here is that you know, we do our best. The FDA is amazing that we have such an amazing mechanism to unify thinking processes to be able to weigh uh, these decisions. It's just extraordinary, and the power of it probably should be more transparent. It might be better if people like us could understand and see the mechanism unveiled and could understand more of the details which we don't get because it gets consumed by social media and it's not well represented. So the dominant theme for FDA approval really has to do with a very strong emphasis on the number of individuals through various phases who are tested for dosage, for safety, for tolerance, um, and for obviously the most important part, which is for the development of immunity, both um, humoral immunity, which are antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and for T-cells. And not much is really said about T-cells. Even in the movie tonight, there's a little bit of head when it's discovered, obviously, that the cocktail caused everyone to have reduced viral loads, and, um, and that gave an opportunity for people to achieve such good health. And that was certainly miraculous. And I think the, the important piece here is that uh, we're all smart enough, actually, even if someone isn't highly educated, and I want to drive this message home, uh, it's a very scary thing to take a medicine or a vaccine that's new. It's just scary. And adherence and compliance to those regimens are, are really low. If you look at lots of studies, if you were to sit down and look at how often people stop taking medicine, you get the strep throat, you're told to take the medicine seven to 10 days, you're told to take it two or three times a day. Nobody listens. It's not in our nature to listen. It's in our nature to be frightened, uh, narrow in a way, protect ourselves, and we need a lot of love. So the one thing I've learned as a pediatrician is when people don't want to comply, you have to love them. You cannot be angry and you can't hate them. You have to love everybody and somehow get people to understand that it's okay to be frightened, it's okay to distrust, and it's okay to be angry, to think that you might be the victim of some subterfuge. I mean, this just, it just doesn't make sense that that wouldn't be the background of all of this. There's, there's structural and institutional racism in our society and around the world. Um, there's all kinds of things that are crazy in our world don't unite us, and to introduce um, you know, vaccines on top of all of this drama is extremely difficult and trying. And I've done a lot of counseling around trying to get people to be more comfortable around vaccines. I do it every week. I work in a foster care clinic in Brooklyn, and a lot of the staff are very, very hesitant to take the vaccines, and some of them are professionals. They're either a health administrator, public health folks, nurses and doctors, they hid and sculpted in the corners, not wanting to reveal that they didn't take the vaccine. And, and when I started at the clinic, I, I told the director of the clinic, I said, I want you to send me everybody who's afraid of the vaccine. Tell them I'm going to laugh with them, I'm going to give them a treat, 
treat them like a patient, I'll give them a star for coming. <laughs> and they don't have to take it. And you know it worked beautifully. I mean, you know, the, the business of, of, of threatening people, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on that, on that, uh, on that line. So <clears throat> I think if, if any of you can take a message from tonight, the, the movie uh, is, is funny in some very interesting ways, but what's great about it is that the AIDS pandemic really showed the scientific community, the medical community, that we had to love, as doctors, we had to be open-hearted and loving, and we couldn't be dictatorial, and that matched a lot of what was going on in medicine in general, about bringing people in contractually, helping people to be much more engaged in their own decision-making. It came from the nursing profession, it came from the public health profession, that people really needed to be respected in order to draw them in to feel as if they could cooperate and understand and be able to even explain their acceptance of things. And I think you, you really can see that the AIDS epidemic was timely in its ability to really help everyone in the healthcare profession to understand how we had to have a patient bill of rights in the elevator, that we couldn't talk about patients in a disparaging manner, we had to have respect for people and that we couldn't make judgments when people were not interested in complying with regimens, we couldn't make judgments. And I, and I think that's the best lesson from the film, actually. It's all about how Dr. Fauci was, he's a very nice guy from Brooklyn, Catholic education, really smart guy, but you know, he's really a folksy, sort of friendly guy who's got a, a a narrow focus, and, and on, around that narrow focus of science is his understanding of human nature. Wife's a nurse. The, the key for them was public health. This whole, you know, ability to, 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 uh, to really commit oneself to this disaster was about understanding human nature. And that's really the, the, the strong part of the film tonight is that when he really understood, I mean, I, I I was a member of ACT UP, and um, I have friends who live with HIV AIDS. I was very fortunate not to lose many friends, but those of my friends who were in the entertainment industry lost hundreds of friends. And it was really a terrible time to be in medical school and residency. And the same is true today for students who entered med school at the time of COVID. I teach at, at Cornell, and um, I'm going, and it's a very emotional moment for me this weekend because Monday is my first day to be back in the classroom in, in, in real time. All these, the last 18 months, I've been teaching the medical students and residents on a Zoom screen. And though it's been extremely lovely and, you know, but the students suffered terribly by not being able to be with patients in a way that's so important to learning medicine and to learning to learning how to be a kind person in the healthcare field comes from touching and being close. So, um, <laughs> sorry, it's just an incredible moment to be here. Uh, I've seen the film now; this is my third time, and I think that it's just for me emotional to relive the time uh, that I um, uh, started my career in medicine wanted to be doctor my whole life and to be part of that adventure and uh, drama and to really uh, be part of the psychosocial aspects of healthcare in a way that helped me be who I am as a doctor. It's just a profoundly amazing and miraculous part of my life. Um, and I, I think that it teaches us so many lessons. And I hope you'll go out tonight even though there aren't a lot of us here tonight, all of you are ambassadors. I always felt like an ambassador. You're an emissary, a kind emissary, where you can make every attempt to be open to people and not to be judgmental and to convert people. <laughs> Conversion therapy in this way, in that you're listeners. You'll be the best listeners ever after seeing such a, a beautiful story uh, about Dr. Fauci and that campaign. 
to, um, to end the pandemic in AIDS. A, a local question to a public school um, nurses. What happens for students if their parents have COVID? Can they still go to school? So, um, if anyone in your house tests positive, that includes your parent, or if you had close contact with anyone who tests positive, close contact definition is within six feet for 15 minutes or longer over a 24 hour period, you would have to quarantine. And I would just want to explain the difference between isolation and quarantine as that seems to be a big question and it continues to be a big question. Um, isolation is what we recommend to people who are already infected with COVID-19, they already have the virus, they're already ill, and they isolate uh, for, I'll just go into the guidance, for 10 days. Um, the reason why we have those 10 days is because research from scientists and from these past 18 months show that once you're infected with COVID, the viral load decreases substantially after 10 days of you having it. And as long as you're 24 hours symptom free, those are those two criteria markers that show that you are not contagious anymore. You are safe to go out of that isolation. If you were to go out and to see your family in the house, you probably you won't be contagious to them. You won't be a threat to them. Um, quarantine is what we recommend to people who have had contact with someone who is ill with COVID-19, but they have yet to develop COVID-19. So it's like a waiting metric here. So they're, they're, the quarantine means that you should limit your contact to only the people in your household. So it doesn't mean you have to isolate into a separate room and be lonely for 14 days, 10 days, whatever the quarantine time frame is, depending on transmission levels. It just means that you should stay at home, you should limit your activities outside and limit the people that you see to only the ones in your household. So the answer to that question is yes. Um, unfortunately, if a child's parent or anyone in their household, including their sibling, tests positive for COVID-19, our recommendation is to have them quarantine for at least 10 days, depending on transmission levels. Um, and that means quarantine from their time of last exposure to this parent. So if the parent, let's say, cannot isolate from this child, if you have a young child, a toddler, a kindergartner, that you just, you have to take care of them. You know, there, there, there are things that you have to do as an adult and as a parent. And so unfortunately, if that circumstance happens, the child is on quarantine for the duration of the parent's isolation, which I said earlier is 10 days, plus their own quarantine time frame because they start from the last day of exposure to the virus. So, yes, answer the question. Good job. Yes. Thank you. Very good, that's tough stuff. <laughs> Do we have questions from the audience? Susan. Should we shout? Yeah, just come, why don't you come to come stand up? That's good, perfect. Did you say shout? Shout. Okay. It's great. So I have a, my question is, um, well, I have two questions, but the first one is uh, the metaphor of the economy. It's, it's, it's surprising to me that Dr. Fauci always language is extremely precise in medicine. It has to be, it's like that. The economy is a metaphor for relationships, for commerce, for marketplace, and it seems to me that there's a fundamental contradiction with the public thinking they should be serving a growing economy for our well-being, and we should be protecting ourselves and be healthy. It's just a push we pull you. So I was very surprised that he, uh, that he, you know, it's kind of trapped, and then the, the news media goes into it in a big way. The economy's got to grow, we have to open. It seems to me the public got completely confused, and it's still really confusing. Is there any short answer to that? that we just need to be health metric, not, quote, the economy versus being protective. Right, and I think you hit it right on the head that, um, I think you hit it right on the head that we don't focus on health as the primary, and we make e economy or finances the primary, and that's the evidence of health of a society. And the thing is, is that it's human health. And I think, you know, Governor Murphy has said, you know, um, public health is economic health. It's both the same, you can't have one without the other. 
um, without people who are healthy to spend the money and to earn the money, there is no economy. You, you know, I think there's a psychological factor here, though. You know, we can explain it. That's perfect. I mean, and, and, and uh, Bill Murphy's amazing. <laughs> really, he's, he's a very nice man and very good. He, he stuns me. I, I know him personally, and, and I, I just think he's a, a funny guy, a human person. You know, he's just human. Uh, but I think the psychological piece here is very important. And if you look at just the history of mankind, what we forget is that human beings are in denial. That's a very important part of why things haven't worked well in situations like COVID, just as an example, or AIDS, or any time when there's a threat in public health. It's because there's a part of us, we're so frightened of our own health and, and dying, frankly, that we tend to shut out and deny our own thoughts about our own body and its limitations and what will happen to us. We don't want to think about what it will be like to be sick. We don't want to think about the possibility of dying. So we put it away and as a result, we're not open and honest with one another about the issues of health. And so we're not a public health or a world public health. Uh, we're not going to be that way. If the only way to change that would be to educate people, self-care, which is just such an annoying and obnoxious <laughs> expression, which you know sort of comes out of the you know the, the sort of popularity of, of, of how we take care of us. If we were able to somehow introduce the idea of good care of self to children early on in life, and for them not to be afraid to understand their own personal health, pain, discomfort, to understand their bodies in a much more, um, how can I say, it's a, it's a way of knowing yourself. You know how you feel, you know that you love chocolate, you love chicken, you love pizza, but you really don't know about your body. You're silent and secretive about what concerns you about your body. And that secrecy leads to poor personal health, and poor understanding of public health. So, and we become afraid. If you look at the history of public health, you'll see how people are always afraid when someone is sick. I don't care what the sickness is. They can have a, a, a cut or a little bit of bleeding. People are frightened of illness. They feel threatened. And it sets up a whole kind of denial it doesn't let people have, have the ability to handle both ideas. I can be sick, I can be well at the same time that I'm sick. And I can actually work and be sick, and I can achieve economic independence if I'm sick or have an illness that's chronic, say. These are not ideas that are taken into cultures all over the world. And I've worked in many different countries, 20 plus countries, with children who are orphans and communities that are resource poor and diverse. And one of the most striking things in countries like Haiti, for instance, is people don't understand their own sense of health. They don't understand how health works. And so even to go to this place where people can really distinguish, they're going to always be divisive about economy and public health. People are going to end up being divisive about it until we learn to bring them together. There is no economic strength in the human society unless there's good public health. It can't be. They are so totally dependent on one another. Edward? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I'll probably be the only one here. In 2014, we went to Wuhan. Wuhan. And one of the things I know, I live in Union, we have an infection rate probably of over 8,000 people in Union. Everything's full some more because of, they're building a lot more multi-unit housing, I think it's a big cause of infections in Union. And, you know, one thing I, you know, how, big is, how big is Union? Well, probably around 60,000. 
60,000 with yes. eight, and you said how many people? Or probably over 8,000 now. Union is big. It's a big town. About nine square miles. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I know you used to be in six something in Texas, over 6,500. I'm not sure what the exact. And it's diversity? You understand what, what it's? I, it's very diverse from my understanding. There's a lot of uh, foreign born, and there's a lot of there's a there's very different demographics in Union. Yeah, like in the county itself, in like Union Township itself. Family next to me, family next to me, all four got in fact with the group next to us. I read that in the next summer, it seems to be able to take food or anything from them. You it's, know, one question I have, like the vaccine, I would not take the J and J vaccine. I was very good at it, I have an I know people in the answer which vaccines that people got here. Some people aren't that perfect. I'm sure it's very but I'm sure that every there's a lot of probably diversity in the room of who got yeah. what. Yeah. But I, I got think your journal, I don't people want to ask what they got. I, I think when the vaccine questions come up, it's really interesting to me, and I'm sure you probably think of the same thing. Yeah. It doesn't matter which one you think. It, you know, the, I would not think change that. Well the the business of efficacy is like a whole other discussion. Right. Now, I, uh, when I used to go to these groups in the DC, we'd argue about protocol, and it was always the same. You know, there's like, you know, there's sometimes there's just too much emphasis on the, the statistics. You know, 89%, 91, 95, you know, you get to a line where you kind of have to say, yeah, average it out, it's pretty close, it's good enough, and that's it. And, you know, and then the key will be you making sure you use the other philosophy, which is about the layers of protection, which is social distancing, right? right. And, and then, and obviously masking, and good hand washing, all yeah. the things that we hold dear in, good, in public health. Yeah, I have like a K95 mask, it's probably better than the, the cheaper blue one. I think, frankly, again, I'm going to, you, you already hear my attitude. You got two or three layers of cotton, you're good to go. You know what I mean? At, I have my N95s for situations that I had to be in that were obviously much more exposure, so I wore an N95. But the, tr the truth is I have a very lovely, nice mask. I have the nicest mask in the collection of anyone I know in New York City. I buy new masks once a month. I launder them personally myself with soap and water every night. I let them dry on a line, so to speak. But I mean, all of that stuff doesn't matter, frankly, at the end of the day. You just mask and you take your vaccine and whatever your choice is. Is anyone going to ask us a question about the So I just want to add to that. Um, the point of the vaccine, regardless of its five, or Moderna or J and J, is to prevent severe illness, and that's exactly what all three of them do. Um, so besides the efficacy, besides the statistics. The point is to decrease the severity of your illness, and all three of them have shown to do that. Um, and honestly, like we, like Dr. Aronson said earlier, medication and compliance is hard. Pfizer and Moderna, that's two doses, some even three. J and J is one. It becomes very easy for people who are medically fragile, for people who are homebound, for people who are bed bound. So it's you weigh your own risks and benefits versus what you need to get. But as Dr. Aronson said. There are very other big mitigation strategies that we take, the mask wearing, the social distancing, all of that to prevent our risk of even contracting it in the first place. Well said. Absolutely. In your opinions, what, has, what would scientifically determine the ability to say the pandemic is over? Oh, well, that's a tough one. I'm glad you asked. Because now it's beginning to be discussed about you know what's the end and i think that there is obviously some statistics here and that'll be the numbers of people who are infected daily by locale by locate you know by location and region and that'll by that'll be country by country and that's why it brings us to this point the end of the pandemic because the pandemic means the whole world is involved seven billion people okay <laughs> right and Kathy. so the end of the pandemic means that every country has the same sort of approach to the statistical numbers that make that country safe and have very little infection on, on an ongoing basis. And that's the answer. And I'm sure a lot of people are in their minds thinking about what's connected to that, which is basically the idea that, you know, where, where can, where do we go?
go next with providing the vaccines. Supposedly, the United States of America will end up spending, at this point, the estimate is we're going to vaccine a billion people. That's, that's what's going to be said. I think it'll be more than a billion people. Yeah, but, but when you look at the world outside of us, which is only 330 million, we have to think about covering the world. So the end of the pandemic is really looking at by region and by country to see what percentage of individuals who will be vaccinated and how many people will be infected on a daily basis. which is that we're dealing with a virus. And one of the things that they say in the movie is that this is a beautifully elegant virus. It has the ability and is, is learning every day how to adapt, multiply, and mutate, which is how we're dealing with the Delta variant right now. The more people who are unvaccinated creates opportunity for this beautifully elegant virus to mutate so this will never end until we have reached a level of vaccination and protection, essentially. Herd immunity is about 70% of the population. So I guess to follow up with the movie, so I can understand better, is the AIDS pandemic over? <laughs> That's a very good question. Not really, actually, when you think about it. There's still, there are still countries all over the world where they, there's not enough money to actually prevent infections, to the, statistically to satisfy that goal, and there are not enough people, not enough money to, to treat, not access to treatment at this point in time. So there's still children being infected. Uh, I mean, I wish I could give you some numbers on that, but you should know generally the take home message here is, I don't consider the AIDS pandemic ended. Um, not at all, and I think most of us who work in the world of AIDS, we know that lots of people don't have access to care. One of the things I'd say about AIDS as well is we are almost 40 years away from the, that incident in the, in the movie and all that we can remember, those of us who were over there then. What people don't know now, we see a lot of young people who are like, oh, it's a chronic disease. I can totally get it. Um, and it'll be fine. Or there's um, antiviral drugs, medication that you can take, you know, to, in case you have it, you can take this medication now that decreases your viral load, and they advertise this. And young people are thinking, I don't know about the people who died. I won't die from AIDS. It's, it's gonna be okay. So there's this danger, from a health educator standpoint, of human behavior, and how we think about viruses, and where we think, oh, is this a chronic disease, or, was it something that killed people, you know, in 18 months? So well, that's why vaccines are so incredibly exactly. important. And we well we know that the human papillomavirus vaccine is a perfect example. That was a vaccine that took better forever to be implemented. And then it was only given to girls. And don't even get me started. How much viral load is? How much viral load is? Can't, can't, it's hard to hear you. Okay, sorry. Can you explain what viral load is? Viral, you have different viral loads. Well, but for our purposes, viral load is an expression that was created around uh, the HIV and the you know, disease. Mm -hmm. So that there, there's, there's a, a way of measuring how much virus is in the human body, in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. while someone's taking antiviral, antiretroviral medication. Mm -hmm. And that we call it undetectable. That means the person is taking medicine that keeps the virus from replicating, and that means that person is in a way cured. Or can't spread. Yeah. But I, I we, you know, I, I hate to do that, but I consider that that's as, as cured as you can be. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's been a couple of very interesting cases of people who are, are really without the disease at all, completely. Very odd and unusual. I don't know, you know, what will be in the future regarding that. Certainly for coronaviruses. When we talk about coronaviruses, we're in a different place. Coronaviruses are really pretty mystifying. And I think there's a great point uh, about um, the variants, particularly. And, and I'll kind of out myself right now and tell you that I'm, uh, and I don't know how many people you know about this, but breakthrough infection, as it's called, 
I, I had through, through COVID. I was a, absolutely been a physician. I'm perfect in my habits, doing everything, and um, and then I and I'm vaccinated. But I knew damn well that the vaccine would wane. Now, I'm turning 70 in the fall, and I thought to myself, I was vaccinated at the end of December, beginning of January, and I knew every month I called the public health administrator person who was in charge of the vaccine at Cornell, and I would call her, and I would or I text her, and I'd say, so, when are we going to get, uh, you know, a, a, a booster? And no word about boosters, and they, you know, were very upset when people started to talk about boosters. Clearly, we knew that the, the immunity would be waning, and there's a lot of difficulty actually defining neutralization of the virus and the role of T cells and how we get uh, how we get boosted when we're exposed to COVID around us. There's so many things we don't know yet. It's amazing what we do know, but we, it's amazing what we don't know. And so now people are getting their uh, booster vaccines, which is great. I can't get mine because I had COVID in mid-July and I have to wait and make, we don't even know about what that means. Like, so will that boost our neutralizing antibodies? Will that make our immune systems better if we have COVID after we have the vaccine? All I can say is that that's a very good point. The most important point is that the vaccine was very effective, obviously, in keeping me from getting very sick. Although I have to be very clear with anyone <laughs> I definitely had um, involvement in my mom. Yeah, and I did it, plenty of did you get it? What? Did you get it? Did you get it? I had Pfizer. It means nothing. I wouldn't blame Pfizer. I wouldn't blame anybody, no matter what I had. I just got it because I was exposed. I know when I was exposed. I know how it happened. It's just the way of it. I got exposed, and I, had, I clearly had the Delta uh, variant and I ended up being okay after a couple of weeks, but it's a very frightening experience. It's really good for people to talk about getting sick and to be open about it so that other people can actually understand. And then they can move to do the thing they need to do, which is get vaccinated. Well, we did get a booster. Do you get the same one that you got eight months ago? That's the that's what we want, that's the recommendation. Correct, that's the recommendation. Um, so there's a difference between booster and the third dose, and I'll just go into that very briefly. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are both doing third doses. So for people who are severely immunocompromised, cancer patients. What's that? So they're distinguishing between booster and third I'm distinguishing between the booster and the third dose. So, for Pfizer and Moderna, the general population got a two-dose series. You got your first dose and your second dose. After much research, after continued research through both Pfizer and Moderna, they showed that severely immunocompromised people, cancer patients, kidney transplants, organ transplants, dialysis patients, HIV AIDS, exactly, they require a third dose. They, they require an additional dose to the general population whose immune system is intact, who only need the two, who only need the two dose. So they get a three series, while the general population gets a two series. Now this booster dose, that is specifically for Pfizer only, right now, is open to people who are 65 and up, people who are age 18 and up, who are who work in occupational high-risk settings, nursing homes, healthcare facilities, teachers, prison systems, et cetera, and people who are immunocompromised. So asthma, heart conditions, the, the, the general immunocompromised people that you see instead of the severely compromised who, who need those three doses. So those are the two differences. And it's a little confusing, and I understand as we have been trying to figure out a way to explain it no, to people, thank you. Because um, you know, the media doesn't do a very good job of explaining it, so it, it becomes a little difficult. So just remember that there's three doses for both Pfizer and Moderna for people who are severely immunocompromised, and then there's a booster shot for just Pfizer right now for people who are immunocompromised, 18 and up, 
all seniors 65 and up and 18 and up individuals who work in high risk settings. There's going to be some, some change rules. Absolutely. Everything yes. changes on a daily basis. Right? We just don't have enough data and enough time to for us to collect the information to see how patients look and how they fare, especially as they maybe get exposures to uh, the disease and they have an infection again. There may be people who get infected, by the way, again, and don't even know that they were infected again. We still don't have, like, we don't have this simple little ability to do neutralizing antibody tests. Um, it's, it's still pretty complicated. That's correct. I just wanted to um, make a point that you talked about um, don't trust what the media said, that the FDA advisory committees are all available online as they're happening. Then they post their documents where it's, it's, it's happening for any kind of, any kind of a new drug. So the, the company writes up their briefing document, the FDA writes up their briefing document, these are put online couple of weeks before the meeting. Two, um, a week ago Friday was the um, was a discussion specifically about the booster shots. So the upcoming meetings about um, the children's data, about the other companies, and all of these are completely open to the computer. Um, so I just want to make that make that point that it's available. It's kind of confusing and there's a lot of doctors see. Um, but it's very interesting to, to watch. For example, the one last Friday, the FDA had a question that they put to the advisory committee and it was very clear from the discussion that the committee was going to vote down the question, which was the proposal was for the booster shot to be given to anybody. Um, but the, the advisors had, they wanted to narrow it, so they took the time, they, made, they voted, took a time out, they wrote a new question, and they voted on that one, and that's, and that's what became the, um, the FDA yep. uh, okay. and, and there's a difference between authorization and approval. Mm -hmm. We're very careful about the use of those words. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And, and as for speaking as a physician, It's the exact same dosage. Oh, yeah, there's no and, change. There's no change. And what's the frequency if somebody needs that third shot? Third shot is four weeks after your second dose, and then the booster shot for Pfizer is six months. You know, but just remember, these sequences may change in the future. I mean, now that we have kids getting vaccines at different doses also, it may be a lot of changes. Yet. So no, no one ages 5 to 11 
have gotten the vaccine yet. We are strongly <laughs> waiting for that. Like, when that comes, that's going to be a very happy day for all of us. But they haven't even had an emergency use authorization for 5 to 11, for 12 and over. Um, I believe it's because of not enough research, so they need the time and the studies. So they were studying kids over age 12 and up, and they have more research than that, and then they start to study younger and younger. So it's just, honestly, it's just a, it's a waiting game uh, for the amount of studies that they have. Uh, Dr. Aronson, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, it was, it was only 2,600 kids that were studied by the age group. It's a very small number when you think about the adult studies. It's data. It's data, correct. Yeah, it's just data. Thank you everyone for